Thanks, Howard. And uh, not just for the presentation, but for what you and your family are doing. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all again. I know it's been a while. Um, and uh, not only has it been a while since you've seen me, but it's also been a while since we started this series. Uh, and so if you can think back like a month and a half maybe uh, to uh, this idea of looking at Elijah, the story of Elijah. Does this sound okay? It sounds very bassy to me, but I don't know if that's bothering to you. But uh, so we are looking at the person of Elijah in 1 Kings. And so it's, this series is called Elijah Peaks and Valleys. And uh, those of you who were here on the 24th of January will remember uh, the story of Elijah in just the beginning eight verses of 1 Kings 17, where Elijah is this prophet of God, and he's going and he's confronting King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. And if you know those names, you know them to be very, very evil characters uh, in um, in the Bible. And so Elijah goes and he prophesies over them and says that there's going to be a drought and that there's going to be no rain in the land until I say that there will be land, which obviously is God speaking through him saying that when God says it will rain again, it will rain. And then he runs and he hides. So he's like at the peak of his like purpose, confronting the very center of power, and then immediately ducks and hides. Immediately goes, runs into this uh, ravine called the Kareth Ravine, which Kareth actually means cut off. So he's going from the very connected seat of power to the complete opposite, being cut off and living by himself. But God provides food for him. You may remember there's a brook that provides water for him, and there are literal ravens that will come and descend and drop him food. So he's sitting there. He's completely cut off from the rest of society, but God has not cut him off. He, God is providing for him. He's giving him a brook, and he's just, he's like literally airdropping food for him to sustain himself. So, you know, you got this peak and a valley, and then, but, you know, God is still, you know, very intimately close to him and very neatly tied to him. Uh, and then we saw at the end of that first passage that we looked at a couple weeks ago, this is then the brook dried up, right? So you got like this peak and then this valley and then this ravine and then, you know, God is blessing him by, you know, giving him this brook and then the brook dries up. And that's just like peaks and valleys within eight verses. So we're going to continue this study in 1 Kings 17. And we're going to look at this idea. Uh, today, we're going to look at this idea of, uh, the idea of pain. Now, I'm sorry that we have to deal with this issue of pain because it's, it's something that may be, may be very personal to you right now, may bring up some past trauma. Uh, you know, I really appreciated Deacon Greg's uh, prayer about, about the pain that some of us are enduring. Uh, and it's, it's good for us in church to be able to put those things on the table rather than just saying everything's great and everything's fine and, and no one is, is dealing with anything. In fact, we're all dealing with something. We're all dealing with pain in one way or another, or have dealt with pain throughout our lives. So we're going to look at this story of 1 Kings chapter 17 as it continues. This is after the brook has dried up, and then it says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. So get up from the ravine and go, stay in Zarephath. I've directed a widow there to supply you with food. Again, God providing for him. So he went to Zarephath. Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And she was go as she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. The beginning of this story shows us Elijah obeying God and finding this widow at this gate. God tells him to get up and, and go to Zarephath and find this widow. And as he encounters this widow, he asks her for food and she's like, I, I don't have any food. In fact, I have a little bit, a handful of flour, and we're going to make one last meal. And the sticks that I'm gathering up are just 
to cook this meal. Elijah says to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, meaning go start that fire and cook that flour. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. The confidence, the audacity for Elijah to say, before you eat your last meal, I want you to feed me. He says, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. He says, I know that what you have is not enough, but God, the same God that sent the drought will provide for you the flour and the oil. This same God who's created the circumstances around the drought, around the famine, the same God that has caused you to not have food will be the same God that will sustain you and provide for you food that you do not have. So she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord had spoken by Elijah. Amen. Amen. You know, we can, we can close our Bibles, we can pray and close, sing a song, and go have some lunch, right? Like this story of God's provision is like, that's what we want. We want that God in our story, in our lives, that when we have nothing, God provides for us, that when we're down and we're cut off and living in a ravine, God sends ravens to come and airdrop food for us, that when we have no more flour and no more oil, there is a prophet of God that will speak provision over our lives. And so whatever pain you may be enduring, you can believe in a God that will provide for you. This is the Bible that we want to believe in. This is the God that we want to believe in. And believe it or not, this is the God that we believe in. This is the God that we can worship. But as we sort of unpack and sort through and sift through some of the details of the story, I think what is interesting here is how we relate to our own pain and how God uses it in our lives. You see, Elijah encounters a desperate woman in a desperate situation at her last resort. In fact, this, there's, a, there's this moment where she says, this is it. And I have nowhere to turn. There's a hopelessness. And so I'm literally just gathering sticks so that we and me and my son can eat our last and then die. But you recognize if you rewind back, this woman gathering sticks at the gate and happens to encounter Elijah. Well, why is Elijah there? Well, Elijah is there because in verse 8, he was commanded to go to Zarephath. And why was he commanded to go to Zarephath? Because where he was in the Kareth Ravine, the brook dried up. So Elijah's looking for a place to go. And then he says, Lord, where should I go? And God says, well, go to Zarephath. And when he gets to Zarephath, he sits at the gate and he just so happens to cross paths with a woman who is gathering sticks. Now pause here and say, okay, well, let's rewrite this story a little bit. Let's say the brook doesn't dry up and then the, the prophet Elijah doesn't want to leave the Kareth Ravine and he doesn't go to Zarephath and he doesn't cross paths, cross paths with this woman who is gathering sticks who then maybe gathers the sticks and goes home and cooks her last meal for her and her child. So when you rewind that story of this provision that God has given to this widow and, this, uh, and her son, you re recognize that it goes through this whole story that where Elijah was and the brook drying up, well, you can actually just tie a string and extend that all the way to the miracle of provision for this woman and her son. You see what I'm saying? Had the brook not dried up in verse 7, Maybe there wouldn't be this abundance of provision in verse 16. So somewhere between verse 7 and verse 16, 
God is weaving together this story. Now, some of you may be living in this verse 7. Maybe your brooks are drying up. Maybe the ravens are stopping dropping you food. And some of you may be living your best life in verse 16, right? Maybe some of you, you, you feel this overabundance of, of provision, right? Your investments are paying off. The market is returning well. You got a good return on your house. Bitcoin is up, right? Like you're feeling good about the things that God is providing for you. But don't forget that maybe this is at the, 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 there are other people that are enduring the verse sevens, right? The, the brook's drying up for us. But understanding that the same God in verse seven is the same God of verse 16. The same God that can provide uh, infinite flour and oil for you, this overabundance of provision is the same God that can make a brook dry up. And so it's interesting, right? We begin to judge God based off of whether we have food or not, whether our brook dries up or whether there is infinite oil in the jar. We begin to determine whether God is faithful based on what we receive from God. When clearly in verse 17, in chapter 17 of 1 Kings, it's the same God. It's the same God that brings famine on the land and the same God who brings rain. It's the same God who makes a brook dry up and the same God that provides the flour and the oil. And so it's interesting for us as we understand this idea of pain that sometimes God allows things like verse 7, the brook drying up, sometimes God allows those things to happen because he has a greater purpose that we cannot see. If you had asked Elijah, are you willing to get up from this place and go and live with this woman so that you can provide for her, that, that, that you will save this woman's life and her son's life? I think Elijah would have been like, yeah, I'll do it. But when verse 7 happens, when the, the brook dries up, he doesn't have that vision. He's not able to see all of the things that connect to verse 16. I'm sure he would have agreed, but yet... In the, in the limited time, in the limited scope that we have, the limited vision, we're not always able to see the purpose behind everything that happens. When you think about pain, pain is something that we desperately try and avoid, right? We try and avoid pain at all costs. We, when we endure pain, we just want the pain to stop. We, we take medicine to dull the pain. But understand this. Pain, in its very nature, is a signal that something is not right, something that is not healthy. I remember a friend of mine who went in to the doctors because he was, he was enduring some back pain. He was very young. He was in his 20s, and uh, he just felt like, you know, oh, this will go away, this will go away, and, and weeks had gone by, and he, he couldn't shake the pain. So he eventually went to the doctor said, you know, I'm having all this back pain. They did a bunch of tests, and it turned out that he had cancer in his spine. And he was treated, and the cancer went away, and he was fine. But you can imagine him during those months of pain leading up to that cancer diagnosis where he would have said, I wish this pain would just go away. And can you imagine if that pain actually went away? That would have been the worst thing for him because he never would have gotten the cancer diagnosis. And so the pain, those months of pain, those sleepless nights, the, the agony of physical exertion for months was actually the thing that saved his life because that pain was a signal that, hey, something is not right here. There is not something going on that is healthy. The greatest pain that I've ever felt, and granted, I've never given birth, so, you know, this is just adjust your scale for, for me as a male, right? But was, I, I broke my leg uh, playing baseball in 2020. Somebody, somebody slid through me, and I don't want to get graphic, but, uh, you know, I was, I, was, I was playing third base, and, 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 and he slid into me. And I remember falling down on the ground and thinking, 
this is pain I have not felt before. Now imagine, right, I, I, in that moment, I want the pain to go away, right? Uh, you, you want the pain to stop. But imagine I just sprung up, right, because I wasn't feeling pain in my leg. I just sprung up and was like, all right, let's play. Meanwhile, I have a broken leg, right? I mean, like, right? Like, imagine I just get up and I start playing again. I mean, that would be very foolish. The pain, the extreme pain, was there to signal, don't move. Something's seriously wrong with your leg. And the, the, the subsequent, you know, emergency room and surgery and, you know, titanium and all the things, right? Like, all of those things are there to say, hold on, like, just slow down. This, is, this may take a while. Because the severity of the accident, was it an accident? The severity of the injury <laughs> was so much so that the pain had to be there to say, you need to pay attention to me. And so understanding that the nature of pain that we endure is not always pleasant for sure. Nobody likes it when the brook dries up. But it may also be a signal for us to say, hey, we need to pay attention to what's going on. Because maybe in the provision, the abundance of provision, maybe you're losing sight of who is the one who is the provider for you. And so maybe when some of those things get a little shaky, it's a reminder for us to say, hey, we need to remember that, that we hold very loosely to our provision. We hold very loosely to our um, security because it's, it's in God's hands. So God uses our pain. God uses our pain to teach us, to get our attention, to remind us of himself. So the, the, the supreme understanding of life is not to avoid pain, but instead to worship God, to remember God. And so whether you deal with pain or whether you don't, the idea for us, the important thing for us is to remember God. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This verse this passage reminds us that Jesus understands what we endure. Jesus understands the pain of temptation, the pain of needing, the pain of wanting. Jesus went to the cross and suffered the, the pain of the crucifixion, but not just the pain of the crucifixion, the pain of isolation, the pain of betrayal, the pain of abandonment, the pain of sin. Jesus understands as the, our high priest the pain that we endure. A.W. Tozer has a quote that says, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man, I'll say a person, God can bless a person greatly unless he has hurt him deeply. It is doubtful whether God can use you greatly unless he has hurt you deeply. Now you're thinking, really like that quote. That's not a very enjoyable quote, right? That's not one that you post up on your mirror uh, as, you get, as you get ready in the morning because you're like, I, I, I don't want to be hurt deeply. None of us would raise our hands and say, yes, I want to be hurt deeply. But when we read story after story of people who have been used by God to reach his people, you recognize that there is a moment, there are many moments, there are seasons where God is bringing them to himself and oftentimes it is through a deep and painful hurt. Elijah ran for his life after speaking to the center of power. And even as he was being provided for, even that situation has dried up. When people are hurting we need to know that there is a God still alive ministering to us. So you don't want to reject the pain just because it's painful. There may be a reason why God is diverting us into that season. Some of you who are coming from Route 80 this morning 
couldn't turn left on that little street because there was flooding, right? And so you had to turn around. Everybody here was like five minutes late that had to come because you, you got diverted, right? But imagine that there weren't cones there and you just didn't know and then you turn left and then your car gets stalled and then you, you know, then you got bigger problems. But as you're detouring, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know where I'm going. I'm suddenly on route four. I don't even understand all this, right? And and it takes longer, but understand that there's a reason why that detour happens that you may not realize at the time. James chapter 1 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Amen. Amen. How many of you, if, if I asked you, said, how many of you want to be mature in your faith? Amen. How many of you want to be complete in your faith? Amen. How many of you want to lack nothing in your faith? You're like, amen. Great. How many of you want to develop perseverance? You'd be like, what, what was that? I'm sorry? It's like, great. Okay, yeah, you know, yeah, perseverance is good. Yeah, yeah, we're amen. Amen. Yes, yes. Great. Okay. How many of you want to face trials of many kinds? Whoa. That's like a bait and switch here. No, 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 I just want that mature and complete, not lacking anything faith. Yeah, maybe, maybe perseverance. Okay, yeah, fine. But we, do, we reject the trials of many kinds. But I mean, it, it's, it's there. Trials, perseverance, maturity, complete, not lacking anything. And on top of that, what does it say? Consider it pure joy. So when you face trials of many kinds, we should consider it pure joy. Why? Because we believe in a God that will extend his grace, extend his sovereignty, even when we are facing trials, to be able to be mature and complete and not lack anything. It's a hard teaching. God uses our pain to remind us of himself. The second point is really just an extension of that first point, which is that, that simply God uses us in our pain. He uses us in our pain, not just uses our pain to minister to us, but he also uses us while we are going through the pain to reach others. When, when we experience pain, we are then now able to help others who have also endured this pain. Maybe around the dinner table, around this loaf and, and, uh, of bread that, that, that Elijah and this wo woman and the, her son are having, Maybe there's a moment where Elijah goes, yeah, 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 I remember this feeling because, you know, I was just in that ravine and I was awfully hungry. But God provided ravens to drop food and he gave me a brook. And I remember being thirsty because that brook dried up, right? Maybe there's a, there's a sharing of pain. There's a sharing of, of story and saying, you know, it's, it's helpful for us to be able to sh explain what we have endured and to be painful. Because I think sometimes in the church, when we get in our community groups, when we get in our small groups, when we get our prayer meetings, you know, they say, you know, hey, how's it going? And, you know, like, oh, yeah, everything's, everything's good. Everything's good. You know, mature and complete, not liking anything, you know? And I think we a lot of times don't say, actually, I, I have trials of many kinds. Because, you know, in the church, you know, we, we got to, you know, make sure everything is, is not, oh, no, I'm faithful. No, no, no. God is, God is, right? We, we, we don't share our pain. And I think in many ways, we, we rob people of the opportunity to be ministered and reminded of God's faithfulness despite our pain. Because we've all gone through pain. Right? I mean, how many of you have gone through pain? No, 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 raise your hand. Legitimately raise your hand. It's everybody. It's everybody, unless you're, you really just don't like raising your hand in public. We've all gone through pain. And so why would we, when we're going through pain, be afraid to say we're going through pain? Nobody's going to judge you to say, oh, well, how, you know, oh, aren't you faithful? Like, don't you love God? 
I mean, we clearly we're seeing that it's, there's no correlation to that. If anything, this is a moment to say, oh, well, you know, God must really love you because he's drawing you closer to himself. This is a path to healing. This is a path to wholeness. And so God uses us in our pain. 2 Corinthians verse 12 says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, this is Paul, he says, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul asked, we don't really know what the thorn in his flesh is, but Paul asked, there was, there was this tormenting aspect of his life. And he prayed to God, he said, would you take this away from me? But God didn't. Instead, God says, I'm going to give you my grace, which is sufficient to take care of you despite your pain. So understand this. Paul says, please take this pain away. And God says, no. He says, no, 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 please take the pain away. God says, no. He says, no, 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 really, the third time, please take this pain away. And God says, no. But instead, I will give you my grace, which is more than enough. And Paul says, what more could I ask for? Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. These are verses in your Bible that, that tell us plainly it's not about avoiding hardship. It's not about avoiding pain. It's not about avoiding weaknesses. It's actually about living in the strength of God despite our weaknesses. We've got to move on. The point is not to avoid pain at all costs, but we believe in a God that is greater than our pain, right? Amen? Well, watch what happens. <laughs> God is greater than our pain. We believe that God is greater than our pain. This is what we've been talking about. So here you have this widow who, who says, I'm gathering sticks to make this last meal. And Elijah says, hold on, we're, you know, God has something for you. And then they just live in this feasting of bread and, and, and water and right, this is provision and after provision, this miraculous provision. And you close your Bibles and sing a song and go to lunch because this is, this is the God that we want to believe in. Verse 17, sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Remember verse 16, right? The flour and the oil and everything is miraculous provision. And literally within two verses, she's cursing Elijah and saying, why did you come here? man of God, because her son grew ill and died. Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid, on, laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. I mean, there's so much going on here, Okay. There's so much going on here that immediately this woman who had this miraculous provision turns immediately as soon as her son dies and says, who is this God? Why have you brought tragedy upon me? As soon as her circumstances changed again, she cursed God. And then by end of 24, right, she's saying, now I know that you're a man of God. Oh, now you know? I mean, not because of the flour and the oil, right? Right? But now you know that you're a man of God. You see, this is how, this is us. This is who we are. We say God is amazing. God is, you know, provider. God is, is, 
is my Lord. And then when our circumstances change, you say, where are you, God? Why would you bring this tragedy upon me? We are this person in so many ways. But here's the thing, right? If we believe to be God, God, that God is greater than our pain. And, you know, we just like three minutes ago, right? I asked you all of this. When we ended on verse 16, I asked you all of this. Is God greater than our pain? And do you said amen, at least in your hearts and in your minds, right? You said amen, and then the widow's son dies. And you're like, oh, I don't know about this story anymore. If, if we believe that God is greater than our pain, if we believe that God is, better than our, is greater than our hunger and our thirst, then isn't he greater than our tragedy? Isn't he greater than our suffering? Isn't he greater than our death? If God is greater than our pain, then he's got to be greater than all of our pain. Not just, oh, he's greater than our past pain because he resolved that. But our present pain, no, 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 I have a lot of questions. Our future pain, no, 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 I'm going to have a lot of questions. So we, we, when we remove our faith in God from our suffering to say, as long as I don't suffer, I have faith in God. When we, when we remove that sort of connection and say, despite my trials, despite my suffering, despite my pain, I will worship God. And God is faithful. That's the sort of faith that God is calling us to, to say that I am transcendent above your pain. So I make pain irrelevant. Whether you go through pain or provision, I'm faithful. That's the type of faith that we want. I mean, the, the, the story that, that Howard shared with us today, that the life that Howard and Sarah and his family are going through was, is really an extension of asking the question, of, do we believe that God of America, that God of Elmwood Park is, is the God of Indonesia? I mean, do we believe the God of Riverside Community Church is also the God of this church in Bali? We have to believe that. It's not just through the provision of this church. It's not just through the abundance of this church, but it's actually through the faithfulness of God to this church. And that's how you can go through a season, a prolonged season, without a pastor to say, you know, God is still our God despite this season of trial that we are enduring. And certainly the church in Bali, certainly the church in Indonesia can say that it's the same God. And so the life and the faith that Howard and Sarah and his family are taking to this place says, I'm going to remove the trials from, uh, um, from my faith to God. That despite all of these things, despite what sort of uh, uh, um, persecution you may be enduring, God is still a faithful God. God is greater than our pain, but Jesus spares us from our ultimate pain. And this is the foundation of everything. This is the foundation of the faith that we have, is that Jesus uh, spares us from our ultimate pain. Which says in, in Hebrews chapter, two, uh, chapter 12, it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of of God. Jesus was the one who endured the ultimate pain for us, the pain of the cross, the pain of the shame of isolation from God. He endured that pain for you, for your salvation. Hebrews 12 continues in verse 3 and 4, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet rest, resisted to the point of shedding your blood. No matter what pain, no matter what suffering, no matter what trial you may be enduring in your life, remember, consider him who endured such pain for you on the cross. Disconnect your faith from the amount of pain that you may be enduring in your life. Let's pray.